Understanding the Bhagavad Gita, Part 5, Chapters 10 through 12, taught by Anantasheshdas. Das. Chapter 10, Sloka 16, says, Please tell me in detail of your divine opulences by which you pervade all of these worlds. And at verse 20, it's responded, I am the super soul, O Arjuna, seated in the hearts of all living entities. I am the beginning, the middle, and the end of all beings. And I find this a very interesting passage which links East and West together because when Krishna gives this initial description, uh, he says that I am the beginning, I am the end, I am everything in between, I am everything that is, I am the all. And this parallels very nicely with the Christian concept that God is both the Alpha and the Omega, right? The beginning and the end of all things. Having given this brief description, uh, for the next uh, 20 uh, verses, we're going to get a much greater description of the Lord being given. And I won't go through all of these uh, verses, but just to highlight a few key elements here. Of lights, I am the radiant sun. Of the Maruts and the Marishi, and amongst the stars, I am the moon. Of the Vedas, I am the Sama Veda. Of the demigods, I am Indra, the king of heaven. The senses, I am the minds, and in living beings, I am the living force, the consciousness. Of all the Rudras, I am the Lord Shiva. Of priests, O Arjuna, know me to be the chief. Of generals, um, I am Kartikeya. And of the bodies of water, I am the oceans. Of the great sages, I am Burgu. Of vibrations, I am the transcendental Om. Of sacrifices, I am the chanting of the holy names. And of immovable things, I am the Himalayas. And it goes on and on like this throughout the various passages uh, until we get this, this very strong sense and feeling that Krishna is truly everything because everything has emerged out of him. Everything has come of his design and everything is part and parcel of him. And so everything is God. Everything is the Absolute. At Sloka 42, it says, But what need is there, Arjuna, for all of this detailed knowledge? With a single fragment of myself, I pervade and support the entire universe. So, in other words, you could go on and give not just 20 slokas, but 20,000 slokas, 20 million slokas of description and you still wouldn't have a full picture of what Krishna is because he is such everything. But why do you need to go through all of that in the first place? Right? A single fragment. I pervade and support the entire universe. One small portion. And we can't even understand that. In that work, The um, Consolation of Philosophy, that I've mentioned from time to time uh, from Boethius, Lady Philosophy comes to comfort Boethius in his uh, cell. And like many people, Boethius in the beginning believes that he has this absolute knowledge and absolute understanding of all things, that he's got the big picture that we all think that we possess. But the fact of the matter is, of course, that we don't. We don't possess all of this. We get hold of some small scrap, some small piece of knowledge, and we come to believe that because of that piece of knowledge that we know everything there is to know. But of course that isn't the case. It's as if we were to take a microbe and put it under a microscope and analyze it and learn every conceivable thing there is to know about that microbe. 
and then claim, because I understand this microbe, I know the entirety of the universe, which is trillions and, and trillions times bigger. It's not possible. So we don't possess this, this capacity to even begin to comprehend how great Krishna is, not through words, not through language. It's something we have to experience. In chapter 11, the first sloka begins, By my hearing the instructions you have kindly given me about this most confidential spiritual subject, my illusion has now been dispelled. And so, again, in the beginning of the Gita, Krishna, uh, Krishna was there, and Arjuna was very confused about the circumstances. He was worrying about you know, his karmic duty, he was concerned about what was right from a moral standpoint, and he didn't comprehend the big picture. But now through this instruction that he's been given, Krishna has revealed to him the information that he needs to have revealed. And because of that, he now understands the true order of nature. He understands what his duty is, and the illusion of this material world is broken. Locus 3 through 5, he says that having heard the descriptions and the instructions, Arjuna asked to be allowed to see the true form of the Lord. Not that form that can be understood through words, not that small, minute, limited concept, but the full picture. That's what he's looking for. And this is a feeling that is uh, shared by many, many individuals. And, you know, George Harrison, who was a great devotee of uh, Krishna, he wrote many songs which were devoted to Krishna consciousness, which were about these themes and these ideas. And the most famous one was probably his song, My Sweet Lord, which begins with a chorus of hallelujahs and eventually transforms into a chorus of Hare Krishnas. But within the opening lines, it says, I really want to see you, Lord, but it takes so long, my Lord. And so within the text of that song, we get this feeling that is shared by Arjuna, that's shared by so many people. I want to really be in your presence. I want to really understand who you are. And this is not something that I'm going to get through scriptural teaching. It's not something that you're going to get by hearing words and reading texts and listening to lectures. Those are stepping stones to get you on the path. But ultimately, it's only through a leap of faith that you're going to be able to transcend beyond this. And that is going to come through your devotional service. That is going to come by the chanting of the holy names to open yourself up to that ability to be able to see and truly experience the Lord. Many people come into the temple during Darshan and they will look at the deities and they will remark about the beauty of them. But when it comes right down to it, that beauty is, as they say, skin deep for most people. But if you are able to truly experience it, to be in that right state of mind, then these deities are alive before you. And that's what Arjuna wants to see. Not the image, not the statue, not the words. He wants to see God right there in his presence. And of course Arjuna on the battlefield has that wonderful opportunity because he's there with Krishna as his friend, as his guru, as his teacher. The eighth sloka, Krishna says, you cannot see me with your present eyes, therefore I give you divine eyes. Behold my mystic opulence. Human eyes are finite and limited, just like the human mind is finite and limited. It's part of this material condition. And so as a result of that, we have to be able me, 
we have to be able to um, have some other way of perceiving. And so we need to see through divine eyes, not through our own. Krishna's eyes see everything. Ours are blind to what is in front of us most of the time. And so actually perceiving, actually seeing Krishna for the first time, Arjuna says, or it says about Arjuna, then bewildered and astonished, his hair standing on end, Arjuna bowed his head to offer obeisances, and with folded hands he began to pray to the Supreme Lord. So Arjuna is finding himself in this very unique position where unlike the vast majority of people, he is there right in the presence of the Lord. He is right there in the presence of Krishna. And he experiences a feeling that washes over him, one that is unlike any other experience that anyone, or many people at least, have ever experienced. And he falls to the ground in prayer. Now what is described within this passage is something that is part of the religious experience. And Rudolf Otto made a uh, very interesting comment with regards to this in a work called The Idea of the Holy. And basically within this text, he says that when we look at the meaning of the word holy, it's taken on a lot of ethical baggage over the t uh, course of time, which wasn't really there in the original concept. And so to correct this view, he says what we need to do is create a new word to talk about this. Instead of holy, which implies all this um, ethical stuff, let's use the word numinous. Now, when we do that, he says that religion is going to have three primary components to it. There's the ratio eterno, the attempt to articulate a world view based upon reason. There's the ethical aspect, which is the articulation of standards of morals, uh, things like what's right and what's wrong. And then there's this thing that he calls the numinous. And so the numinous is the holy minus its moral factor and without any rational aspect. He says that the numinous is not reducible to any other factor and it can only be understood when there has been an existential experience of it. And so this numinous is characterized, he says, by two main elements. One is a sense of preacherliness, and the second one, which is what we want to focus on here, is this sense of tremendous mystery, what he calls the mysterium tremendum. Now the mysterium tremendum, as you see on the uh, screen there, has three basic elements to it. There is the sense of awfulness, right? That this is a terrifying experience, something that is beyond fear. Right? When you meet with a being that is as great, as magnificent as God, you recognize just how uh, insignificant you are and how tremendously magnificent and powerful that deity is. There's the sense of majesty, which is a recognition of the greatness of the divine. And this is going to lead to a sense of humility within the individual. Uh, kind of a recognition that we are s insignificant. We are small ants in relation to the universe and even more so in relation to the divine. <coughs> and finally, there's the concept of energy, which is the idea of a vibrant, living, acting reality. Now, it's this aspect that is taken to the utmost reaches of our consciousness. It's beyond the ability of language to even be able to express it. And this is where the difficulties come in. This is why, as we saw, you know, you can talk and talk and talk in terms of these descriptions, but these words are only going to get you so far because these words are ground in human experience. Their words, language, is created so that human beings can interact with each other and can express certain thoughts and certain ideas to each other. But when it comes right down to it, we as individuals 
don't have the language to adequately express what it's like to stand in the presence of the divine. And so that's where this vibrant energy is going to come from. It's something that you're going to feel. It's something you're going to experience. And it's going to make you afraid and make your hair stand up on end. And it's going to reduce you to the most humble of individuals because you realize just how insignificant you are in comparison. But at the same time, you're also experiencing something that is truly tremendous, that is truly wonderful. And the mysterium element is the fact that this experience is wholly other, that there is nothing like it anywhere in the universe. There's nothing else that we can even begin to experience that would be like that idea of standing in the presence of the divine. And of course, this idea of being completely other cannot be separated from the concept of the tremendum. And so this is what uh, Otto explains uh, in this work, the idea of the holy. And the point of this is just to demonstrate to you, I guess, in a little bit more Western language that you might understand what it is like for Arjuna, what it is like for anyone who comes to that point where you can truly experience the presence of the divine. Language so often gets in our way. And that language is part of the material world. Through devotional service, through the chanting of the holy names, you can transcend beyond that limited language and eventually attain that genuine experience. And you can feel in that moment what it is that Arjuna has felt. Locus 31 through 33. O Lord of Lords, so fierce of form, please tell me who you are. I offer my obeisances unto you. Please be gracious to me. I do not know what your mission is, and I desire to hear of it. Now here in this passage we find that idea of Arjuna becoming submissive. We find his humility. He's recognizing how insignificant he is in the grand scheme of things. He is not God. He's not divine. He's a mere part and parcel. He's an appendage of the divine. He wants to fulfill his dharma, his duty, but he doesn't understand what it is because he can't see through those human eyes. And so he needs the divine eyes of Krishna. And so he asks, what is your mission? What is it that I need to do? Let me hear about it. The Blessed Lord said, Time I am, destroyer of the worlds, and I have come to engage all people, with the exception of you, the Pandavas. All the soldiers here on both sides will be slain. As we said back in chapter 2, the people on that battlefield who are going to win have already won. The people who are going to die have already died. There is, it's already laid out, it's already planned. And everyone, with the exception of the Pandavas, is going to die upon that battlefield. And so, this is what is my mission, he says, this is what must be fulfilled. And the question, of course, for Arjuna is, as it always has been, will you fulfill your dharma by being part of this mission, or will you try to fight against it? even though doing so is futile. Therefore, get up and prepare to fight. After conquering your enemies, you will find a flourishing kingdom. They are already put to death by my arrangement, and you can be but an instrument in that fight. He is one instrument. He's an important instrument, but the battle will take place with or without him. And as it, was says, uh, as it was said before, if he doesn't choose to fight, in some way he'll be compelled into it anyway. But what is meant to happen will happen. The real 
question of choice is on Arjuna. Will he do his duty willingly? Will he follow his dharma? Or will he cling on to the material condition and try to fight against it, thinking somehow that he is the controller, thinking somehow that he is the doer of things? But we find that through this instruction that Arjuna is gaining his knowledge and intelligence, he understands that he's not the controller and doer of things, only Krishna is. And so it's his duty to perform, and he will fight. Sloka 36 O Hirsakesa, the world becomes joyful upon hearing your name, and thus everyone becomes attached to you. Although the perfected beings offer you their respectful homage, the demons are afraid and they flee here, and there um, and there, all this is rightly done. This reminds us once again about the power of the name of Krishna. That name is so powerful, that name is so strong, that simply invoking it brings God in the present. It links you directly. And so this Maha Mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. By chanting that name, by taking the name of, of God, it causes those demons to flee, and it strengthens the glory of God within the heart of each individual. Slokas 53 through 55 says the form you are seeing with your transcendental eyes cannot be understood simply by studying the Vedas nor by undergoing serious penance nor by charity nor by worship it is not by these means that one can see me as I am my dear Arjuna only by undivided devotional service can I be understood as I am, standing before you, and can thus be seen directly. Only in this way can you enter into the mysteries of my understanding. My dear Arjuna, he who engages in my pure devotional service, free from the contaminations of fruitive activities and mental speculations, he who works for me, who makes me the supreme goal of his life and who is friendly to every living being he certainly comes to me and so the message to Arjuna the message to all of us is to recognize that only through bhakti only through loving devotional service are we going to have that genuine connection that genuine relationship with God and this is something that we should be seeking out, something that we should desire. But so many people believe that, oh, I can do it by studying all of these scriptures and reading all of these commentaries that all these different people have written. But all these different commentaries confuse the issue because people bring their own interpretation into what is being said. This is why, again, we work from a book called the Bhagavad Gita as it is. This is not the interpretation being given by some scholar or another. This is the original meaning, the original words as presented by Krishna to Arjuna on this battlefield. And these words can be used as a stepping stone to help us on that path to devotional service. But again, those words will only take us so far. It is the loving service that is going to fulfill that link and is going to help us to realize our true self. Moving into chapter 12, the first couple of uh, slokas, Arjuna asks, who is more perfect, the person properly engaged in devotional service or the person who worships the impersonal Brahman? And Krishna responds, those who fix their minds on my personal form 
and are always engaged in worshiping me with great and transcendental faith are considered by me to be most perfect. And so we're told here again that those people who are engaged in the service of the Lord, those are the perfect ones. These are the ones who um, are, are the most beloved, the most blessed of Krishna. Sections 11 and 12 tell us that devotion is the recommended way to the supreme liberation. Those people who worship with the greatest faith are most united, but those who worship the imperishable, the unmanifest, the omnipresent, they also attain him. Knowledge, we're told, is better than practice. Meditation is better than knowledge, but renunciation is better than meditation. And so the general idea behind chapter 12 is that the person who worships with devotion, someone like the yogi, is a friend to all, someone who is free of ego, who is indifferent to pain and to pleasure, who is patient, who is self-restrained. These are the beloved ones of God, and this is what we should strive to become, that practitioner of bhakti yoga, that person who lets go of material attachments, who lets go of sense gratification, who is not affected by the things of this material world because their mind has elevated to a higher platform. These individuals who live simply for the loving service of God, they are the ones who are the beloved because they have not been fooled by the illusion. They understand their true original constitutional position. And they have no want, they have no desire for self and self-gratification. Their actions are solely to glorify, to glorify Krishna. And so once again, we've come to the end of our time here together. But before I go, I wanted to remind you once again that the lectures that you've been listening to are intended to complement your reading of the text, not to replace it. Um, I, I'm making comments on passages and trying to help you to understand it as we go along, but that is no um, reason not to pick up the text itself. And so I encourage everyone listening to get a copy of Bhagavad Gita as it is, to read through uh, the wonderful words of Krishna, as well as Prabhupada's commentary on it. Read it along with the lectures that you're hearing here, and I think you will get a tremendous amount of benefit from doing so. Uh, if you have any specific questions, feel free to email to anantasheshdas108 at gmail.com, and I will be happy to uh, offer any type of response that you may have. And so until next time, Hare Krishna.